Okay, Ray, thanks. So I, I wanted to start uh, by talking about uh, phases of life. And you've, uh, you know, you've talked about that a lot and talked about the particular phase you're in. So I wondered if you could start by giving us a perspective on what, uh, on what phase you're in and then stepping back and sort of putting the phase of life you're in uh, in the context of, of all the different phases of life. Okay, um, I'm in the phase of uh, transitioning from the second phase to the third phase, so I guess I'll explain what that means. Um, I think there's basically three big phases in life. The first is when you're dependent on others and you're learning. You're basically going to school, you have parents who are taking care of you and so on. Then in the second phase, um, you're working and others become dependent on you and you're trying to be successful. And then in the third phase, um, you're free. They, you know, as Joseph uh, Campbell said in his book of the Hero of a Thousand Faces, you are free to live and free to die. And in those transitions between them, um, they have their own characteristics. And they're very, those phases are very different. So, and they're instinctual. So like I feel the desire to transition well, which means I'm no longer motivated by being successful myself as much as I'm excited about helping other people be successful. I just watched um, with my uh, grandkids, um, uh, I think it was Empire, um, anyway, it was one of the Starwoods, the second Starwood, I don't know. And Empire Strikes Back. Maybe. <laughs> Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. And there, is the, there are the mentors. And that's the joy because they're of a certain age and that's, that's how I feel. So that's where I am. Uh, and tell me, tell me, tell, talk more about this phase. Um, the, you know, what it feels like, the, the sense of satisfaction, what gives you satisfaction, what feels different? Um, what are the challenges of being in this phase? Well, the greatest reward is seeing the people that you care about do well independently of you. So, you know, let's say if I think about Bridgewater, I feel like a father of a 45 year old, you know, like I sort of raised Bridgewater to some extent. And, but uh, what do you want of your 45 year old? You want them to be good without you. And so that notion, how can I help? Do you want to go have a beer? Um, um, if seeking the advice, um, doing that and savoring life, you know, that, that, that's okay. The challenges of that are interesting because, um, I, what I, what I observed is that the people I'm transitioning with, which are my sort of extended family, sometimes don't understand that desire of mine that, that you know, and they think that I, I might want to control and they don't understand that there's no desire for control. It's instinctually to transition. So one of the challenges is, uh, you know, to let them do it their way. And, and as you know, like, so we'll get real, you know, as, as we're doing that, um, you know, our arrangement is pretty much, not yours and mine, but also in the investment area, is pretty much along the lines like, um, if. You know, if you don't want me to do it, I'm not going to do it. And and if you're and but my doing it is uh, going to be my doing it in my way. It's tough love. And but if we can do that, and that's appreciated by both of us, then we can appreciate the relationship. So sometimes there's a little bit of a problem there in terms of realizing, you know, well, why is it being done? Particularly when I'm uh, my style is to do it kind of with that tough love. And how did you know uh, you were in the third phase? When when did it become clear? Was it gradual or, you know, through my eyes, it, it kind of flickered for a while. You were a little bit in phase two, a little bit in phase three, uh, but I, I feel like you're clearly in, in phase three now. H how did that transition happen? Well, it was, yeah, it was evolutionary. I mean, let's, you know, um, I don't know how many years ago, it could be decades ago, but not uh, literally, but almost, um, that I, I, you know, I wanted to transition. And then uh, you remember the transitions um, and the, the challenges of the, those transitions. 
Um, and I was, I, I really, I did want to transition then, and I really did want it sincerely to go well without me, and it, and it didn't go well at first. Um, and I learned, you know, like I have a basic uh, uh, principle. If you haven't done something three times before successfully, don't assume you know how to do it. And so we, I didn't transition, and transitioning is a difficult thing. And so that didn't uh, work out the first time. And then I had to get back in for a year, and I did it. And you know, you know I'm like, I could just as readily ask you the questions as you could ask me the questions. But um, it was that notion. And um, that sense of responsibility, you know, responsibility for the family at existing at the same time. And so trying to give as much leeway without um, at the same time worrying that uh, trouble would happen. And I, I think it's probably like the parent, you know, who um, not so much that they want to control, they don't want to control, they just want the best things for them. And if, and if it's at that stage where it's not clear who the guidance is and who, who, you know, who's running the place and is it all going to be okay, uh, that meant that I had to do it. And so it was, a, it was a transition. And so when we did that and then we evolved past that and we got to this stage and I started to see how, you know, it's good and also like it's your business, not my business. Um, that all became uh, better. And then also certain things um, evolve, you know. Um, having a grandson um, starts to also change one's perspective, change my perspective, you know, because I could see beyond myself. I could, you know, seeing the grandson could me, uh, start make me realize the multi-generation. In other words, I know I'm not going to be here for all that arc. And I could also see beyond that. And so, and, and then there was just something natural about it. Um, I think there are phases in life, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when, when you have those, I, I don't know how much they're psychological. I don't know how much they're physiological. But uh, um, there was a wonderful book that was uh, given to me by Barbara, by, by the name of uh, Hadrian's Memoirs. And it was um, uh, the Emperor Hadrian, and he didn't literally write it, but it won um, some great, it was a French writer who wrote, um, wrote this book, and it was a masterpiece by literature, and it captured his thinking. And, um, and it, there's a naturalness that comes from um, saying, yeah, you know, like winning a battle I can go in there, I could fight, I could win a battle again, but what am I doing? I'm just winning another battle. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, that's not the best. So the best is to evolve beyond it and to help others win the battle. So I think it's the confluence of all of those things that kind of evolves, um, and that's how it happens. So gradual would be a better term for it. Yeah, it makes sense. Ray, I think presumably part of what drives you and, and brings the focus and clarity to phase three is the inevitability of phase four. And, um, and so, uh, you know, you talked about success uh, in phase two being the, you know, the, defining yourself and so forth. I want to, I want to go to that in a minute, but as you, as you sort of look towards phase four and you say, okay, I want to put a bow on uh, my life, my relationships, my contributions, how does that factor into the way you think about how you spend your time, where you devote your energies? How do you think about that within the, within the overall life cycle? Well, for me, my, uh, my personal objective is to um, squeeze the most out of life, get um, um, evolve, and then contribute to evolution in, um, in, in, you know, and then pass away. And I realize that I'm not even going to leave a footprint in the sand. You know, I'm, 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 I'm totally insignificant um, and it, w it won't matter. It is really, um, uh, for me, uh, feeling good about that whole thing, you know, feeling uh, I, um, I evolved in the most I could. I squeezed the most life out and... Um, 
And I really do believe I got the most out of life that anybody can get out of life of all the various things I've gotten. And then I, you know, want to make sure that I've contributed the most and then passed along those things that are of value. Those things that are of value um, are, I think, most importantly, um, ways of being that work well for me. They don't have to be for others. So those are the kind of principles. So when I uh, wrote my book and I wanted to pass it along, um, I also imagine that my grandson and grandchildren uh, will read it uh, when they're when I'm not around. And uh, how you are is the most important thing, right? Like I didn't, it's not the money. I'll pass along the money. I'll pass along other things, uh, but the, the, I, I didn't, you're born with nothing, you know, you end with nothing, and I didn't have anything. And so that notion of, okay, for anybody who wants it, there it is in a, in a book, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, passing it along in the ways that, uh, you know, one, one could pass it along for people to take or leave. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, that's, that's good. Uh, and and go to phase two. And when you were in phase two, particularly in the early days, and you were defining, you know, be successful. Um, what what were you? What was you, what was your aspirations? I mean, it must be beyond your wildest dreams in terms of how things have turned out. But what what were you thinking at the time when you were Ray Dalio at twenty five or thirty, and you were thinking, I want to define, you know, my life and my legacy and my success? What were you thinking at the time? Well, for me, it was mostly, um, it, it was honestly like, um, have fun, have an adventure, uh, and do it with great people. So like, um, my friends have always been important. Re relationships have always been important. So I come back to this meaningful work and meaningful relationships. And then the game was important. And adventure was important to go to places and meet all different people who are different, all different environments. So to have, I, I had a pull to adventure um, and, and I wanted to do it with people I had a blast with. I didn't have a pull to big money. I never had a pull to big money. Um, I, uh, I, I wanted to um, make sure I had enough money to take care of my family and to be able to be independent. And then I wanted to be creative. I mean, I like visualizing things and building them out. I think that's cool. I like that. And I wanted to do that with other people. And then uh, things happen. And then one thing leads to another, right? And so, um, yeah, when you, th when, like when you said uh, being successful, uh, like even, even now, I don't look back and look at successful in the way a lot of people think I must be looking at th being successful or even the way that they look at me as being successful, meaning making a lot of money or uh, whatever other ways of, of successful it's in. It's been more like um, I just love the game mm -hmm. and I love and I like the freedom and I like the exploration of being able to go all over the world with interesting people. Those would be the things that have been my pull. And then each step leads to something else. And it's kind of like I described, you know, in, in the book that, uh, you know, go in the jungle, you know, imagine yourself at the edge of a jungle and you could be safe on one side of the jungle or you can go into the jungle to get at the other side to be successful. But because it's risky when you go into the jungle, take on the risk, you have you know, all sorts of things that can happen in the jungle. So what do you do? So for me, uh, I needed to have the best life possible. I couldn't play safe. That was my instinct. And then I wanted to, and then I go into the jungle. I, of course, I have to go into the jungle. And that means risk and return. And But then I find myself going into the jungle with people I care about. And I'm now in that jungle uh, and we're fighting, you know, the animals and we're succeeding and so on. And I find I don't want to get to the other side of the jungle because to, to that success because I'm loving being with them, fighting on that kind of mission. And then I'm evolving past that. So that's what it was like. Yeah. 
And and as you look back on phase two, if you had a do-over, is there anything fundamental you did? I mean, obviously you made mistakes and all of that. So I don't mean that. But I mean, if you had a do-over on phase two, would there be any significant shifts you'd make in how you define your success and what you where you spent your time and energy? No, because, I mean, while there would be things, there are always things that I learn and change along the way and whatever, I, if I think about that as being part of the process, in other words, the surprise, you know, you climb up and then you come to a new world that's a new surprise, would I have wanted to not climb or would I have wanted to not have the surprise? Yeah. No, I, I, I would have wanted to still have, climb and have the surprise. So even the falling down and all of that was just all part of the adventure. Sure, I, I you know, it's almost like if you could get life perfectly, would you want to have life perfectly? I don't yeah. think I would. Yeah, because it puts everything else in perspective when it's imperfect. Yeah. Um, uh, I want to turn to Bridgewater's founding, and you've obviously covered this a, a lot in your book and so forth, but... Um, I thought maybe we we might touch on some new ground. You you talk about how early on you had this love of the markets, and um, you know it started, I guess, when you were uh, a golf caddy, and uh, you know you started took your first dollars in Eastern Airlines and so forth. But um, talk a little bit more about that in terms of your interest and why the markets uh, were were something that intrigued you so much. And then, if you would, um, at what point did the you know the epiphany come together that you didn't uh, you didn't want to want to be part of something else? You wanted to build your thing, and just take us through that uh, a, a bit and what the actual origins of Bridgewater were. Well, um, yeah, as you as you said, I started catting it when I was twelve. Uh, I, I, I start that was the t excuse me. I started a little bit before that, but twelve was when I bought my first stock. And the environment at the time uh, was uh, the 60s real excitement bubble kind of environment. You know, through all my years ever since, I've never seen a bubble or an environment that in which everybody, every time you got a haircut, the barber was the talking stocks, everybody was talking stocks. And so when I would caddy, they were, and I was, and so I got hooked. Um, and, and I loved, I loved the game, you know, and I thought it was going to be a very easy game because you open a newspaper and there are all these stocks and I just had to pick one that would go up and I would be good. So I thought it was an easy game and I got hooked on it because for, for a, a totally stupid reason, um, you know, I th thought a company was going to, um, it was cheap of uh, under $5 per share. Uh, and I figured I could buy more shares. And that's the only reason I bought it because I was the only company I heard of for less than $5 a share. It tripled because it was about to go bankrupt and somebody luckily acquired it and I was hooked. Figured this is a great way to make money. And anyway, I loved it. So I got, I hooked. So fast forward, um, I started trade commodities uh, because it was more leverage. I can, I can borrow more money and so on. And a friend I went to, a guy I went to college with who was older than me, traded uh, commodities a little bit. And, and so I did that. That led me, um, uh, when I was um, in school, and um, anyway, fast forward, Harvard Business School went um, in the summers. I was in commodities division. Then I graduated in 1973, which was the year of the oil shock. And commodities were hot, and the stock market was down a lot. And I was hired as director of commodities at a brokerage firm, a, a successful brokerage firm that became unsuccessful because of the bear market in stocks. And then I went to um, Shearson Hayden Stone, but, uh, um, a broke that brokerage firm. I was very sort of independent, and I was kind of rowdy. And I um, had a uh, a boss. Uh, and I sort of got drunk on New Year's Eve with the boss and I, um, and we were pushing each other around. I decked him. He went down, had a black eye, totaled his car, his wife chewed him out, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Didn't fire him. But whatever. <laughs> yeah, you're going through this fast. There's a lot. <laughs> you're going through this fast. <laughs> well, There's it's a long way. way. It's There's a long a story. Any, um, and anyway, um, I then um, found that, um, uh, clients of um, Shearson uh, liked 
the advice I would give and so on, and they'd pay me money, and I could, uh, and I was in a uh, brownstone, two-bedroom brownstone, and I'm um, my roommate moved out, and I took over the uh, apartment, and a guy I played rugby with uh, would help me, and then we, um, and I started play the play the markets, and he would, and the clients would pay me money, you know, and I started to do that, and and I, wow, it was free, and I and I love doing it, and I'm very much more of an independent thinker, which you have to be, I think, in the markets. And then anyway, fast forward and then- that 27 though at that age? Like when when did you, when was the last time you had a boss? Mm, yeah, like- I mean, other than Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> last time I had a boss, although all my clients, is, uh, clients have been bosses. Yeah. Um, uh, last time I had a boss was something like 27. Yeah, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, then I had the ups and downs and, you know, the famous, I mean, famous, my big crash in 1981 and two of expecting the depression that never came and having to let everybody go and to be alone, you know, and then thinking, oh, gee, am I going to get a job? I mean, honestly, the, what was the horror for me was, am I really going to put on a tie and get on a commuter thing and go to Wall Street and do that? Ooh, I don't think that's going to be. So I pushed through it. And, um, but I learned my, uh, I learned fear of being wrong then. Yeah. I learned my humility and so on and so forth. And then that changed and, you know, so on for there. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because it, you couldn't, you couldn't probably be, you know, the independent thinker and have the courage to go out on your own and everything without that brashness in some ways that overconfidence uh but then the overconfidence had to eventually uh, uh have its match in the failure which gave you the humility and so it's that it's that interesting balance right that's that's it like if i can give it to anybody i want them to have the audacity the um you know the zest the adventurousness coupled with the fear of being wrong Okay, that that notion. So, like the decision making process, like I say, you know, decision making is a two step process. The first take in and stress test what you're thinking, and then make your decision and make your decision with a lot of diversification because you're still going to be wrong even when you do it in the best possible way. And that's the key to success: triangulating well with people who will stress test you. That's the key to success. Yeah, but I think, um, you know, the thing that is assumed there, not assumed, but I see this with my kids. I'm not sure if you've had this experience with your kids, your grandkids, but um, if you have a little uh, too much fear of being wrong, you're timid and you don't move forward. And if you have a little bit too much confidence without enough humility, then you're reckless and you, you know, you get yourself in trouble and getting that balance of the brashness and the willingness to take risk with the humility, it's, it's hard to get that balance right. At least I, I see that as an individual, but also as a parent. Yeah, but just as as soon as you realize that it is in those things together that you've got the power, you genuinely realize it, then you don't want it any other way. Right. Um, and it's like um, I, I, I was, guys who were doing um, incredibly risky thing, you, you know, um, What's the guy who, uh, uh, they did the movie on the guy who did uh, Climb Del Cap Capitan. Um, um, I forgot the name of the movie, but I got- uh, Solo. Uh, Solo, uh, yeah. yeah. And I, I got to meet the guy and I was talking with him and and people who, um, you know, do right, take the tight rope walking across the, the twin, twin Towers or something. What they learn is um, to be extraordinarily risk averse. Yeah. So that I think you, we've all seen this, that you know you can do anything if you pra if you practice and you're risk averse, you can do the most riskiest things in the safest way. And yeah. once you've got that aligned and you know that, that's what gives you the confidence because the choice is the, the risk or reward trade off is a bad trade off otherwise because either you're not getting the most out of life because you, it's too risky, 
or you're crashing and you know and you're doing things that are intolerably bad but you can have it both you can have it all really pretty much if you know how to do those things together mm-hmm. um well part of part of the story along the way obviously is that uh, the culture of Bridgewater, which which presumably started with a, a employee number one, uh, there was a you know there was a way you were operating. But um, my guess is that that evolved over time a lot based on your experiences and so forth. At what point did you start to transition in your mind from just the way you were being to that way of being as something you wanted to try to institutionalize and reinforce? in the people you were with, where it started to become a thing in and of itself, as opposed to just the natural way you were. Do you, do you understand the question? Well, yeah. Um, I think it's, it's like, look, we're partners, right? So if we're partners, how do I want us to be partners? So it goes from one to many and then saying, and then trying to extend it to many. So, like, I want to be radically truthful and transparent with you. No bullshit. Um, That's what it is. And if I think it's bad and you think it's bad, it's okay. And if we disagree, that's okay. We can hammer it out and we can get other somebody else to judge who's right and who's wrong. We can find a way of getting through it, which is one of those fundamental things I think that's necessary for all great relationships. And then, and I believe that if I didn't operate that way as it's growing, um, for the other person who's just following, um, that's going to pursue resentments. They can't speak up. They're going to have bad thoughts, and I won't even discuss it with them. They're going to be alienated. They won't get to think for themselves. And so, uh, and then, so what would I want? A, a bureaucracy that's going to be following me? I'm insecure about b- being wrong, and, and besides, they have to be able to fight with me. So it just became the necessity to extend that with scale, and that's when. Um, that's okay. So that's when radical truthfulness, radical transparency and writing down principles happened Mm -hmm. because like by being able to tape everything and listen and have everybody listen to it, there can't, that radical transparency can mean that there's no spin. And it put me in the position of then saying, okay, well, here's why. And so I would take the time, you know, pain plus reflection equals progress, or if in that circumstances, and these were real circumstances, not the BS kind of things where you make the world like it really isn't, you know, and those types of things, you know, that, and you have to work yourself with doing the right thing and weighing the pros and the cons and doing that openly and then discussing it with people required me to write down the principles one by one and then to tape them. And then, so we now have, you know, I don't know, something like 600 tapes of people watching those things in action. So there's no bullshit. And so, you know, people do it and that got people engaged and and so on. So it was the needing to be that way with each other so that there could be trust, so that they could be on the same mission, so there could be that same understanding. So that's how it evolved. And was the, um, was the 27 year old Ray Dalio in his, you know, partnership with Paul Coleman, I think was the, one of your earliest partners. Was that pretty much the same guy we see now? Or have, you know, how's, how are you different from, you know, 50 years ago or, or more? I would uh, get drunk more. I would be more politically incorrect, probably. I'd be, um, uh, you, you know, the parties were probably better. Um, <laughs> the uh, I have know, no doubt about that. <laughs> um, you know, I would say, um, but, you know, like at the core, uh, p- pretty much, I think, pretty much the same. You know, pissing people off in the same way and, having them like me in the same way and so on. And the family thing, the extended family thing, always the same. I tried to stretch it as far as I could. Yeah. Well, um, what's interesting about this moment, this on our chart of the five, um, your role's different uh, than it was in the previous ones. And, um, And that sort of brings us full circle, which is the last topic I want to talk about, which is we started the conversation with transition in your life 
and I want to end the conversation with transition at Bridgewater. And, um, you know, when I came, which was uh, September of 2009, we were talking about this. You were talking about this. And, you know, we, you really said somewhere in 2010, we announced it to our clients in one of our client notes. You said you envisioned a 10-year transition. And um, it had different components to it. It had a ownership component and a governance component. It had a management component. And I remember thinking to myself, 10 years, like that's a freaking lifetime. Um, this will never take 10 years if we're smart and we do things, you know, we do things well. And of course, it's taken every bit of the 10 years. And we're still, we're still finishing the final strokes on this. Uh, and we've had our ups and downs, you know, you and I both, I personally had them. You've had, uh, had lots of things that have gone well and lots of things that went poorly in your transition. Um, I just wondered if you could sort of look back on it, the last 10 years of transition, where do you think we are? How do you feel about it? Um, what are you most worried about? And, you know, be brutal about the things that are most on your mind and that concern you and just, uh, just some reflections on that. Uh, yeah. Uh you're exactly right. 10 years ago, like I said, um, I think it'll probably take three years, uh, but could take 10 years because of, you know, like saying, if you haven't done something before, don't assume that you know how to do it. You have to assume there'll be mistakes along the way. And so, um, you know, I hadn't transitioned before. Um, and so, um, and, you know, and here we are. So fast forward uh, to today. Um Okay. Um, like I say, I feel like I'm uh, the father of a 45-year-old uh, who I want to be really good without me and so on, and I am transitioning. And, and I think we're really in good shape in terms of the um, everybody understanding uh, their responsibilities um, in that and what our relationship should be. Wow. Like, think about it. Um, I don't want to do anything that others don't want me to do. And, uh, but if they want me to do something to be of help, I want to be, I'll be of help. So that's like the mentor, you know, it's like that. So that's, and that's what it should be. And wow, we've made it here. And we're lucky to have um, remarkable people. Um, you, uh, Bob, who's been here for 34 years or so, Greg, um, and so many others who, like, that's the family. They understand it, but it's now a multi-generation family because there's a generation after them and that is that has grown up. And that is the culture. And they, they really are close, this meaningful work and meaningful relationships thing is a reality to them. The idea of meritocracy, that we can fight these things out. So the culture um, is, is, is believed, it, it, you know, is imbued in the way it should be, including get rid of whatever they want. So they know that they own it and that they can innovate and move and abandon anything they want to abandon, but they're good people, meaningful work and meaningful relationships. And then we have to have that same entrepreneurial in this institution, we have to have that same entrepreneurial, creative, um, um, bet on yourselves, don't be on, in the institution and always sort out who is good and who is bad from me uh, it doing what? And it's like a team, you know, I was asked, is, is, is Bridgewater a team or a family? Well, I guess it's got to have elements of both. It's like a family that we love you, but if you, but if you, you can be cut, you have to be cut from the team because it's got to be the most effective part of that team. And so that notion of knowing good and bad and being able to thrash it out and do that in an entrepreneurial environment is now up to those people. So the success will come from that balance that you talked about. You said your kids, it's tough to, for you to get your kids to know, you know, not, not to be so aggressive and not to be timid, but to simultaneously uh, be smart and be aggressive 
and then be very fearful of being wrong and to triangulate well so that you know that you could walk that tightrope successfully. And so, uh, and, you know, and, and so seek out the innovators, seek out what you don't have, and that will be um, the test. And I think, um, you know, I'm seeing that. I, I see a lot of that. Um, but that'll be that'll be the, uh, the test. That so that's the thing I wish I could give most to people. Mm -hmm. And is that the thing you worry most uh, risk Bridgewater's long term success not having that that essence? Yes, that would be the thing. But no, I don't worry more about that than I worried about many things along the way. Right. You know about Bridgewater. But that is the thing, right? Because if you've got what it takes as a team, you could adapt to anything. All I want to do is have, all I've always wanted to do in the beginning was have an equal shot at competing. Yeah. And so when I started, you know, there were these giant firms and big banks have asset management and so on. And there was just me and my two bedroom apartment and so on. And I, all I wanted was an opportunity. And when you get down to it, whether it was me there or you think of a lot of other entrepreneurs, Steve Jobs or whatever it is, Elon Musk or, or whatever it is in each in their own way, those are sent, that is the power that destroys the behemoth successful institution that it's unimaginable can be destroyed by these David and Goliath stories. But it is, it, it, so it is that. And if you look back on the transition, um, I'm going to ask you the same story about, you know, I asked you about the second phase. It, obviously the, the failures are what we learned from and, and helped us everybody grow on this, but would you have visualized it different? Is there anything you would have done different in terms of how you handled the the transition and the succession? Or do you feel like you, you know, you, I think I, uh, you know, um, I wish that somehow I, I, I made it easier on other people. I wish I wish that I made it easier on other people. I think I could have made it easier on other people by emphasizing and, and exploring the things that I did wrong better mm -hmm. and also making clear that whatever they did wrong is, you know, is not them. It's just the evolutionary process. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, it, uh, you know, I, I think if I was to do it again, I would do it better mm -hmm. in that way. Mm -hmm. I could see that. Yeah, I could see that. Um, final question. So um, I don't know, it's 10 years from now, it's 20 years from now. We, there's, there's a virtual boot camp, and um, we're going to give you a 30-second clip uh, to talk about uh, Bridgewater and to, and to sort of give words of wisdom to the, to the, to the newcomers. Uh, what would be, what would you say? What, what are the things you really want people to have most in their mind? Obviously, you've talked a lot in this interview, but, you know, the, the, if you boiled it down to the essence, what would it be? Um, be audacious and humble at the same time. Um, love your mistakes, recognize you're going to make them, and that in them are the learnings, if you do right, if you treat them correctly. Recognize that meaningful work and meaningful relationships are the, the best things in life that will make you not only but make you successful and reward you in all ways, not just financially, but reward you in the ways that you can hug each other, you're around the people you want, and you can be on your adventure and your dream together. I think those would be the most important things. That's great. That's a great finish. You should write a book. <laughs> <laughs> I should stop writing books. <laughs>